Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Raya Salter. And I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia. In our show this time, we'll take you on a visit we took to the Honolulu Biennial 2017, an art exhibit which is now on display all over town. The Honolulu Biennial includes art from Asia Pacific and from the Americas, and it marks Hawaii's entry to the International Biennial Circuit. The Biennial highlights the vitality of Hawaii in the global contemporary art scene. It features 33 local and international artists presenting art relating to local and international issues. It includes talks and events with those artists with a view to achieving discourse on the environment, society, and culture. The Biennial calls on audiences to re-examine their own awareness and to engage on crucial local and global issues and to achieve cultural diplomacy and understanding through art. And that, of course, includes the rich cultural and artistic diversity of Hawaii. The hub of the exhibit is located at the old Sports Authority space on Ward Avenue. There are also exhibits at the Honolulu Museum of Art, Ward Village, Honolulu Hale, and Foster Botanical Gardens. It's a celebration of art all over town. And there are also related displays at the Bishop Museum, the Arts at Mark's Garage, the Hawaii Prince Hotel in Waikiki, and the Shangri-La Center for Islamic Arts and Culture. Honolulu had an inaugural biennial exhibit in 2015, organized by the Honolulu Biennial Foundation with support from various local businesses, especially including the Howard Hughes Corporation. The 2017 biennial, now two years later, is much bigger. The opening night of the exhibit this year was at a big party on March 8th. The exhibit is still going on and will run until May 8th, so there's still time to see it. It will be well worth your while. went to the hub at the Old Sports Authority space and spoke with Isabella Elahe Hughes, co-founder and director of the Biennial, about the creation and development of the program. The only way you can pull off a project this large is with, you know, 40 to 50 plus partners who've made this possible, including our founding title sponsor, the Howard Hughes Corporation, and we've got local, national, international partners who've worked with us to present 33 artists who all come from a 
Hawaii, the Pacific, the Asian continent, and North America for the first ever Honolulu Biennial. We're spread amongst nine different exhibition sites. I'm going to count them this way or I'll forget. Please. We're operating little sleep right now because it just opened. Of course, we're here at the Hub, 333 Ward Avenue, former Sports Authority. This is really the central indoor location. We are exhibiting 22 artists and artworks here, including a variety of new commissions. You also will find work at the historic IBM building, also at Ward Village, at the Bishop Museum, at the Honolulu Museum of Art, at Hawaii Prince Hotel, the Arts at Mark's Garage, Honolulu Halle, Foster Botanical Gardens, and Shangri-La, a center for Islamic art and culture. So myself and my two fellow co-founders, Dr. Cohen Jeff Baisa and Catherine and Leilani Tudor, all three of us are from Hawaii. And something we noticed is that outside of the islands, there's very little knowledge, recognition, inclusion, and conversation about artists from Hawaii, from our native Hawaiian local and Hawaii-based artists. So we really saw a biennial, which is a very established format of exhibition making. There are over 100 in the world as a way to mitigate this and heighten awareness and inclusion. And at the same time, um, around the same time when we were thinking of doing this, um, we used to have a contemporary museum that since has merged. So we did lose in the state of Hawaii a dedicated space to exhibiting local and international artists. And you cannot deny the power that art and culture has for really fostering tolerance. Absolutely. So a biennial format really seemed the best fit because we were able to, again, highlight local talents, but at the same time, really bring in different cultures and communities which are all linked through the Pacific Ocean right here for our audience locally. It's a really weird sort of situation that for some reason or another, although the talents coming out of Hawaii are completely on par, on caliber with any international um, talents, we just have been forgotten by the larger, um, very active contemporary art world. Um, one cannot deny the weight that the word biennial carries. We wanted to, from the get-go, be part of that conversation using industry terminology and that festival format, although ours is a very specific response to our culture, our place, all the exhibition sites in history. Um, so it's been wonderful just to see with opening week, visitors from major museums, other different biennials and triennials, collectors, curators, all traveling here from all over the globe and um, I look very forward to a fruitful future where hopefully the outcome of this is we see more artists from Hawaii included in the next two to six years on a national international scale. And we hope all of your audience will come and visit us. Again, we run from March 8th until May 8th and you can find the opening hours for all our different exhibition sites on our website, honolulubiennial.org. We also spoke with Sama El Shabi and Jane Chang Mi two artists who had contributed their art to the biennial. As it works out, both of these artists focus on issues relating to climate change. My work is always usually dealing with the, the, the body's relationship to land based on national, uh, national identity. So the, the root causes of conflict usually have to do with resources. And in this age, in this era that we're in, um, water is the all-encompassing problem. I am Palestinian Iraqi, um, was born in Iraq and had a life of forced migration due to the uprooting of war. Um, in fact, the war between Iraq and Iran started over the control and power of the Shat al-Arab, the Arabian Straits, the Persian Gulf. Who controls that controls the outflow of where the oil goes. So that is how my own life trajectory started of moving from place to place and understanding what the plight of refugees and eco-refugees um, have and what their situation will be because of losing their land. I'm working on a video project here at the Biennial. Um, it's called Wasal, which means union. It's Arabic for union, from a larger project of mine called Silsila. And for seven years, I have been going through, I've been traveling throughout North Africa and the Middle East, primarily in remote regions. Um, in the desert and um, our water sources and eventually the project extended to the Maldives who is also facing water stress but of water overabundance of sinking into the ocean with the rising uh, uh, sea levels and Hawaii became part of the project in 2014 when I was here and I saw that that island story as well where water and it's it's this islands unprotected and it's particular especially Honolulu it's particular position in the ocean makes it very vulnerable. It's the regions that produce 
oil and, and provide oil for the rest of the world are not usually the ones who consume it at the highest levels. And in fact, the communities I'm really interested in, I'm speaking to, are the ones who are without a lot of agency. I mean, they're not the, the urban dwellers. They're, they're in the oases. They're in the villages. Um, their, their carbon footprint is minimal. It's nothing, really. But they can't exist without the basic sustenance of life, which is water, fresh water. And that is uprooting them and making them, causing them to live in urban centers. And these are obviously the developing world where um, not necessarily strong leadership and governments that can understand and know how to provide for the people well um, usually exasperates issues when, when um, people come together that not, are not normally living in close proximity and starting to compete over the very limited jobs homes and resources. And so um, this connection to fossil fuels in, in general, I mean, as I said, they're not the, the ones who are uh, consuming at the levels like we are here in the West. They're the most demonized in society. I mean, they, as I said, they don't have a agency. Often when you're having to move, you're to a place, you're in, you're in a position of desperation. Sometimes you don't speak the language of the place that you're going to. And so we've We've demonized them and we've criminalized a situation that's really out of their control. Or you're actually running for, the, for survival, right? Four or five years ago when I was in the middle of this project, this was before the, ep the, the epic refugee crisis that we've been seeing over the last um, you know, 18 months. And I actually, in a talk with an interview, I said, I believe in the next few years, you're going to see refugee issues at levels, unprecedented levels. The Syrian war is a water war. It's an issue of water. It's a water, it's a drought that forced um, farmers off their land and into the cities and then a poor government response favored certain families and tribes and it didn't allow for political dissent, a protest, peaceful protest and fear of that he would lose his position in, in the history of the Arab Springs and all of these leaders being taken out, uh, overreacted. And now we have one of the worst wars, uh, unprecedented amount of refugees in a world that nobody wants them, and where do they go? If that's just one country, and Syria is not a very large country, I mean, imagine Hawaii, imagine the Maldives, those are the ones that we know, but it's going to be far greater than that. There will be entire um, coastal regions of Europe that will no longer exist. Most of North Africa and the Mediterranean is, is, is in fear of disappearance. And at the same time, you go 100 kilometers south, there's no fresh water now. I was, I lived that life, but in a war like such as Iraq's, you know, Iraq has been having wars for the last 20, 30 years. But when I was younger, there wasn't this, um, I don't know, there was more tolerance about people coming in and the laws were not so strict. I don't know if, it was, if it's because we're in the information age with the social media such as it is and people can get their comments out very easily. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Or is it just the numbers? The sheer amount of refugees is very frightening or very threatening um, in a hyper-nationalism world that we're living in right now. I feel like my work is about the environment in general and our conversation with it, right? We're in an immersive space right now. Um, and I think often we forget our relationship with the land or like the aina here. That's why Hawaii is so important to me. Mm, makes sense. Um, it's the place who's, that, that's like taught me this importance in conversation with the land because we forget about it often. The installation that you see, it's called the Eyes of the Gods as a whole. There are fish prints um, on the wall as well as some historical... Um, drawings of Stokes photographs from Pearl Harbor um, in the early 20th century um, and so it touches on the different or alternative history of Pearl Harbor as a whole. Um, the video is actually taken from um, all the surveying of the USS Arizona and Utah so oh, as a scientist or as a National Park Service member um, and also US Navy diver they go and they survey the boat to make sure it's stable right because it's a memorial and and so they take video when they're down there. Got it, um, got it. And so uh, working with a coder, we took out all of the spaces where it was just water um, and made it into a video so to, in order to reclaim space, right? Because we don't, all of us don't necessarily have access to the three locks the way that we used to. Mm -hmm. Because it was 27 fish ponds at one point in time, and then it was a really large recreational area for everyone. You'll see as we talk, um, 
all of the water is constantly changing. So this is over about a 10 year period of archive and it actually has the entire spectrum of the rainbow. Like it's gone blue, it's green, it's also pink, it's yellow. Um, but so that water is actually very in flux, right? It's not just always like water. And sometimes I think we forget that. Um, obviously we have a lot of surfers here so they know what I'm talking about or we have fishermen and things like that. But sometimes when we're not um, in the environment, we, we forget that there's movement and it, and it has a life of its own. The project that I was working on in Molokai in Kalapapa, um, we were modeling with Autodesk um, corals to see how much uh, coral die-off there was from acidification, but also like if there was growth or not growth. Mm -hmm. um, we, especially with all of the agriculture that we have, um, a lot of the runoff into the ocean um, in Hawaii, I think also with all of the development, um, though development can be very positive, and you know, you look at um, other artists' work in the biennial, at times that affects things, right? So like the rains now, there's much more pollution in the water. Like I swim at Kaimanas all the time and mm -hmm. and like you can see the change even in the last couple of years of like the small, there's a huge like brain coral right there. And every time you can, you just swim by it, you see how there's a difference. If you think about it, Pearl Harbor, I don't have any pearls from Pearl Harbor, right? Like if you go to Tahiti, everyone gets pearls. Um, and so there's this questioning about like why some place is named or the history of the name before it becomes like a central like idea within our consciousness, right? And so I was really interested in exploring that. Um, originally the Hawaiian name for Pearl Harbor was Pualoa, which means long hill. And like I said before, there were 27 fish ponds there and there were fish that lived there. So I was really interested in looking at, okay, well, what what other history is here um, just beyond the attacks of Pearl Harbor because that's generally what is in our narrative. Um, and so if you look at that, the Stokes photographs, for example, show the 27 fish ponds. And even then, like there's one of the Japanese making the pond. So by 1911, the Japanese were also making fish ponds. We are trying to bring fish ponds back in Hawaii in general in regards to sustainability so that we're not dependent on whether it be the mainland or Asia to get all of our food. But that requires a certain level of sustainability. Um, the Hawaiians had different names like for one fish. So this is the ama ama or the ane here. And it would be it would have different names based on the size of the fish. So you can tell that like fish ponds are very important. Um, our makahiki, um, which is like the celebration of harvest, is now based on um, what community may have brought from Big Island, but it used to be based on the migration of this fish, um, and it would come from the locks and go up to Lae and then move around, and, and it was named accordingly. I don't think it's necessarily like native or non-native or indigenous or non-indigenous species, it's just the fact that, for example, I was reading, I think yesterday, um, 19 of the 27 reef species within Oahu are threatened. Mm -hmm. I think it's just really important to to better understand um, like what was going on. And like I think sometimes we forget that, and I think this is where the naming of things becomes important, right? Like I cannot name every single tree that is on this island. Um, well, why not, right? Like why is that not a part of our education? Like do, what, is, what are the names of our fish and why? Um, and so I think scientists are starting to study this. A lot of the people I went to graduate school with all work for NOAA now, right? And so these institutions are really, really important in regards to like trying to determine what's going on. So I think that this entire, like the relationship between all of that is like ecosystems, right? Like everybody plays an important role and it's important to hear those voices of those roles. While we were there, we walked around and took a look at the art that was on display and we spoke with some of the people who had also come to see it. Hi, and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's coverage of the Honolulu Biennial 2017. I am Raya Salter. So we're here in front of a very interesting exhibit. So an artist, Li Mingwei, I believe is his name, decided he was going to take a lily and live with it for a hundred days to honor the passing of his grandmother. An interesting homage about the banal activities of day-to-day -day life in while honoring your grandmother. The biennial is a must-see for anyone interested in discovering the art and engaging on the issues of our time, and to see how far Hawaii has come in joining and participating in the international and cultural art community. Join the celebration. Go there soon and before May 8th, and as they say, expose yourself to art. Want to know more about the biennial? Check it out at honolulubiennial.org.
And now, let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. There's so much happening in Hawaii. Sometimes things happen under the radar and we don't hear much about them. But ThinkTech will take you there. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times every week to stay current on what's happening in government, industry, academia, and communities around the islands and the world. ThinkTech broadcasts its daily talk shows live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. If you missed a show, or if you want to replay or share our shows, they're all archived on demand at thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. The audio is on thinktechhawaii.com slash radio, and we post all our shows as podcasts on iTunes. See our website for links. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links, or sign up on our email list and get the daily docket of our upcoming shows. ThinkTech has a high-tech, green screen, First Amendment studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to join our live audience or participate in our shows, write to think at thinktechhawaii.com. Give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at thinktechhi. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives together in these islands. We want to stay in touch with you and we'd like you to stay in touch with us. Let's think together. While you're watching any of our shows, you can call in to 415-871-2474 and pose a question or make a comment. And now, here's this week's Think Tech commentary. One of the ways that stereotypes become norms is through art. Oh, hello. Yeah. That's right. I mean, think about um, classic art of Europe uh, from the Renaissance. And think about some of the nudes that were painted. Mm -hmm. Da Vinci, um, Rembrandt, Holbein, some of those folks. They portrayed the woman's body as something uh, beautiful, first of all, but, but voluptuous. So you and I would be supermodels. The artists were commissioned by people with money to paint various subjects. And you know what? What? This still goes on in that it was a subject of a discussion at the biennial in one of the artist talks. Uh -huh. They had the curators there um, talking about some of the sort of political and social issues that sort of came to bear and clash um, in sort of setting up the biennial. But it wasn't really about like women in particular, but it um, just that this is a, you know, but there's a lot of power in the ivory tower. Indeed. Yeah, there is. Um, and art is also one of the ways, historically, that the stories of those who are not as powerful and who may not have had as, as loud a voice in society of their time, this is one of the ways that, that snapshots of their lives can be perpetuated going forward. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. <music>
Okay, Cheryl, that wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Cheryl does. For additional times, check out OC16.TV. For lots more Think Tech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on Think Tech, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our Think Tech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii, and of course, art and culture in Hawaii. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Raya Salter. I'm the host of Power Up Hawaii. You can see me Tuesdays at 2 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com. And I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia. I'm the host of Working Together. You can see me on Tuesday at 4 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha, everyone. Mm -hmm.